What does luxury mean to you? Luxury. In India, I discovered that true luxury isn't something you buy off a shelf. True luxury is a feeling that you are the Maharani of your world. And it can be all designed around you. All the beauty is yours. All the music is yours. India showed me that luxury doesn't follow designers and brands. True luxury follows its own heart. Incredible India. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Maitri Vaidya Sadness. I am an associate professor with Department of History in the Maharaja Sayajira University of Baroda, Vadodara, Gujarat. I am also one of the chief editors of the three volumes. I welcome you once again on this fifth day of the seven day lecture series based on our books on princely states of Gujarat. Today, we'll be discussing about the economic aspect of princely states of Gujarat. All of us know of how the colonial policies had impacted Indian economy in uh, British India. However, when we look at the economy of princely states, most of the states enjoyed relatively lesser interference from the colonial government and hence had perhaps a thriving urban economy, at least in some cases. However, there was one economic feature where there was always a dispute between the regional states and the colonial government or a paramount government. These were the disputes over seaports. The first two lectures focus on ports of Gujarat owned by the regional states. The first lecture is by Dr. Kenneth X. Robbins, who will speak on Cambay port and the ports of Kutch. The second lecture will be by Professor John McLeod, who will be speaking on dispute over princely, uh, princely seaports in Gujarat, 1890 to 1947. The third lecture is by me, where I talk about the participation of women in the business activities of a Sahukari Pedi or family firm of a state. With the permission of the hosts, may I request Dr. Robbins to deliver his talk. Thank you. Thank you, Maitri. Well, I, we've produced these three books and dozens of authors helped us do this. Um, we produced digital and hard copies. Um, in India, the hard copies should be available at Pathy, but I understand that they haven't actually been released at this point. I, think that they may have been released worldwide uh, at Amazon elsewhere in the world. Digital copies are apparently available worldwide at Amazon. Today we're going to be speaking about chapters from the second volume of our book and this deals with the economic history of the states of Gujarat. And if one looks at the history of, uh, of Gujarat, one sees that it is close to the sea and a good deal of its history uh, is centered around two gulfs, the Gulf of Kutch and the Gulf of Cambay. These have been seaports for a long period of time. These seaports have changed over times. Not that far from Cambay was Lothal, and in the northern part of Kutch was Dolavara. So these are seaports that existed th literally thousands of years ago. We speak about Cambay today. We don't speak about all the other ports in the Gulf of Cambay. We speak about Cambay itself. We speak about Kutch. We speak about a series of ports ranging from Dolavara to the mega port of Mundra today. Also a big difference is when we take the history of Cambay, we don't hear much about 
local people going out to sea. We see about this being an entrepot for imports and exports. Whereas when we talk about Kutch, we talk about the people of Kutch going literally to Arabia and Africa and playing a role in international trade in both places. So let's start with Cambay. Uh, I'm wondering how many people have even heard of Cambay. Uh, it's a small town, uh, it, but yet it was extraordinarily famous at one time. Extraordinarily famous at one time. It was a place that was visited by travelers from Europe, from the Islamic world. It was an entrepot and marketplace with renowned textiles, marble carvings, precious stone industries, and people collected agate and uh, carnelian beads as well. It was the chief port of a number of West Indian based imperial dynasties like the Solankis, who ruled in the 10th to the 13th century, and the Sultans of Gujarat, who ruled in the 15th and 16th century. And you can understand why, for example, the Sultans of Gujarat used it as a port because they ruled from nearby Ahmedabad. The Sultans of Gujarat often sent royal ships with riches to Jeddah. Uh, one sent a large Quran written in his own hand with funds to set up a madrasa. On the right hand side, you see some of the earliest pictures of Cambay, which were done in a document, uh, an illustrated manuscript of an Italian traveler who died in 7, 1517. His works have been translated into 50 languages. And one sees the king of Cambay on the top and a money lender below him. So this tiny town, why was it so famous? How did it get so famous? What did it travel with? Well, if you look at the center of this map, you see Cambay was in the center of trade from the 10th to the 14th century that ranged all the way down the East African coast. It went across to Muscat, uh, present, the capital of present day Oman, and around to Mecca. And all sorts of things were taken to Cambay. It was everything from copper to wine, to precious stones, to tortoise shells, to pearls, you name it, it went there. And the trade not only was in the Indian Ocean, uh, per se, it stretched all throughout Southeast Asia, as far as Canton, and as far as Java. When one looks at the exports, one sees the same things, that there was a huge amount of trade coming out of there that stretched across from pilgrims and coconuts to Arabia, to pearls and gold and uh, silver and silk to Southeast Asia. In fact, Cambay was the center of the monsoon route, the epicenter of international trade, which included the Middle East, Arabia, East Asia and South Asia. All the big Arab travelers like El Masudi and Ibn Battuta came, Marco Polo came, the Italian uh, traveler Ludovico de Varthema, whose uh, manuscript, you, illustrated manuscript you saw a few, a few uh, slides ago, came. They all came. They all said Cambay's harbor, fortifications, gardens, industries, mansions, everything was fantastic. To understand the nature of this, one can look at the magnificent tomb of the king of merchants who died in 1333. If one looks at his tomb, one sees that it combines elements from Islamic, Gujarati and other Indic sources. How famous this was can be told in two tales. 
One, when Vasco da Gama came to meet the king of Melindia in East Africa, as you can see in the picture here, he was given a bedstead from Cambay with gold and mother of pearl. Once Queen Elizabeth I addressed a letter to the Mughal emperor as the king of Cambay. So this was an internationally known place. What happened? The last one to dredge the harbor was the Sultan, was the Sultan of Gujarat. By the late 17th century, it was silting and gradual receding of the sea. Boats ran aground at low tide. And there were all these shifting tides, shifting sands that made navigation difficult and formed sandbanks to the point that the sea no longer washed the city walls. By the 17th century, large quantities of goods had to be sent to a nearby port to be loaded onto ships because it could no longer be loaded uh, in uh, Cambay. So we look at the map of Cambay, one sees several things. Cambay is at the top. If one goes down the left-hand side, one sees Goga and around uh, to the bottom there, we'll see the Port of Du, which was uh, owned by the Portuguese. And one goes to the right, one sees the burgeoning ports of Saruj and Surik, which came up big. Now the Portuguese try to cut, cut off the linkage of the local Gujarati merchants with the Southeast Asian markets. Cambay became a supplier to Portuguese ports and then to the emerging overseas port of Surat. The Mughals also preferred to take a safer trade route going east from Surat and north to Agra rather than the, rule, than the route through Cambay, which was tr more treacherous. As a result, Surat replaced Cambay as the embarkation center for Hajj. So as the harbor silted up, the largest ships had to be unloaded elsewhere. The Portuguese diverted trade to their own ports and later the English favored Bombay and sir. This didn't mean that the Dutch and the British didn't also work in Cambay, where they were involved in the silk and cotton textile business. And even in the 18th century, Cambay was still a great center for manufacturing trade in agates, in indigo, cotton, embroidery, and so on and so forth. But Surat became an artisanal center, and later, of course, Bombay became a colossus as a manufacturing center. So they were both were more than just commercial ports. In the 18th century, the nominal power in Gujarat were the Mughal emperors. But their officials, seeing their, that they were increasingly weakening them, weakening, became de facto rulers in their own rights. This was true of the Nawabs of Cambay. The important West Indian ports of Barut, Cambay, and Surat were all controlled by Nawabs, who had to defend themselves against uh, the, the Peshwas, the Gaekwads, and the British, who were trying to control the whole area. At one moment, it seemed like the Nawab of Cambay might become a major player in the brutal battles for power. And if one looks year by year at Gujarat in the 18th century, one sees various powers seeming to increase their control of areas. And you're wondering if they are going to become much more major factors in the power struggles. But the Nawab of Cambay not succeed. Initially, he fought back the Marathas and even captured briefly Ahmedabad. He declared this right in the name of the Mughal emperor. 
and it helped legitimize his rule. The Mughals, of course, were far away and didn't control him in any way. So one could see that the history of India changes from moment to moment. By the 19th century, Cambay had become so poor that there was only a little bit of trade down the coast. Uh, the, the British resident uh, left Cambay because it was so unimportant. And the British suppressed local manufacturing and even suppressed the manufacture of salt, which, which was part of a good part of the state revenues. Uh, the British also built railroads and metal road construction bypass Camp Bay. So skilled workers and artisans moved elsewhere. Even the Bora traders moved elsewhere. So what would happen? What was the attempts on the part of the Nawabs and the government of the Nawabs to change all this? Uh, a modernizing prime minister dismissed many of the corrupt bureaucrats and allowances to indolent, indolent uh, retainers and overhauled the revenue system. He launched a ambitious public works program, but there were major disturbances. In 1895, Madhav Ram Vyas became the day one and decided he was not only gonna reform the administration, but he was gonna develop a modern port. And he took various measures to do that hiring a port engineer, constructing a wharf. They purchased a dredger to keep the creek and gulf deep enough to admit vessels year round and a steam launch to tow country boats out to where cargo from steamer could be transported. But they were unlucky. Uh, a steamer was lost. Uh, the British decided we don't like this. They replaced the prime minister. The dredger was sold for a small fraction of its cost. And the British got Cambay to quote, contribute the steam launch and so on and so forth. A third prime, prime minister uh, was Namada Shankar, Dev Shankar Mehta. Actually he was important. It, he was appointed to head the Port Trade Development Agency. And um, the port volume soared. And the administrative report showed that it's made clear that the channel was capable of navigation. But we'll see how the British squashed that in John's lecture. Moving on to Kutch. One sees the strategic position of Kutch. Across the, the sea to Arabia, up to Sindh and Baluchistan, and down to Africa. And so there have been many ports over the years. It's interesting that though the Kuchis were international traders, and you think that they would have played a, uh, the, the local government would have use some sort of international currency that Kutch maintained its uh, own currency until the time of independence. What's interesting about the people of Kutch is that they were seafaring. I remember many years ago that this surprised me because I had been taught that all Hindus and Jains, Jains I was told as well, were afraid to cross the sea because they would lose their caste. Well, I don't know. I'm not even gonna talk about something like that that's totally wrong. Uh, but seafaring people of Kutch sent traders across 
to Arabia and Africa. And this tradition of shipping and trading stretches over thousands of years from the Harappa times. The one, now Baron Ran of Kutch was a place where you could have ports. And today we have the rise of Mantra as a mega port in India. Geographically, this was a place that was isolated at many ports along coastline and was ideally suited for inland trade as well as sending Indian goods abroad. It was at the juncture of the maritime spice and slave routes and the overland camel caravans. So almost everything could be carried from Kutch. The Rouse of Kutch, who ruled for several hundred years, favored maritime development. Look, they were an arid dry land that was not particularly suitable for agriculture or raising animals. And each of the important Maharas of the 18th century had strong maritime policies. One individual, Ram, uh, Ram Singh Malam, came back from Europe with all sorts of advanced technical knowledge for the Rao to use. Kutch's population had to find ways of earning money outside of Kutch. This was a place where you could have epidemics and earthquakes, failures of rains, the Sindhi invasions, uh, the British import duties on local products, and so on. One of the key events, for example, was the damming of the Indus River in 1764 by an Emir of Sindh. And this made farming very difficult in many parts of Kutch. In 1813, a famine resulted in the deaths of nearly half of the population. And after that, a few years later, there was an earthquake and a tsunami, and the uh, great port of Lakput uh, was destroyed. In addition to which, Kutch had a lot of local battles uh, with neighboring states like Morvi over uh, the uh, sovereignty of the Gulf of Kutch and whether Kutch had the right to uh, restrict trade and, um, and so on. There were also, this was a place where there were fights between the rulers and other members of their clan brotherhood, powerful officials and uh, other political figures. So if money was to come, it was gonna come from outside. So they had problems with water, earthquakes, famine, neighbors, internal strife, and so on. What is amazing is the number of ports that were built. The Rao of Kutch even personally supervised shipbuilding and repair at Mandvi. And a number of ports traded. Anjar from the 16th to the 20th century, Bouge from the 17th to the 20th century, and so on. Kandla, uh, Lakpat, until the, uh, the earthquake uh, and Mundra uh, from the 17th century on. So Lakput was faced with the earthquakes, the changing in the course of the Indus and so on and so forth. So this was a unique seafaring tradition. The trading networks included Muslims, Hindus, and Jains. For example, a 13th century poem uh, tells of a Jain Kuchi merchant who made so much money in, uh, in Hormoz and uh, Aden that he built a mosque in Badrashwar with the permission of the Jain council that ruled there. There was a lot of tolerance and acceptance, so that you have the Rao of Kutch protecting the Hajj pilgrims and getting a, an exemption for tribute by the Mughal emperor for this reason. And the Rao's financed an annual ship to Mecca until the mid 19th century. 
This international trading network included Kuchi bankers and financiers. The monasteries of Goswamis and Manvi were also monetary and banking centers, issuing bills of exchange and corresponding with agents across the Indian Ocean. Uh, and so what I've tried to do in my collection is find actual documents that talk about these things of uh, actual uh, Kuchi merchants in places ranging from Gwadat to Zanzibar. Now it was in Zanzibar that the Kuchis played a huge role in trade. The top two figures are both sides of a document uh, showing power of attorney between Kutch and Zanzibar. Um, and the bottom right shows a poster of a saint who is venerated in East Africa. Many of these Kuchi merchants, Banyas, were extremely wealthy and yet led very simple lives. Uh, they were in Indian traders in Zanzibar were only 214 in 1819, but 50% of the imports were of cloth from, uh, from Gujarat, which was more durable and cheaper than that of Manchester. During the early 19th century, Kutch imported as much, twice as much ivory as Bombay and Surat, and also was prominent in uh, the import and export of cotton goods. The British introduced heavy duties on goods arriving in Bombay from Kutch and other princely port states. These Kutchis led a very interesting life. They supplied guards, porters, uh, they bought up the whole cargo of German and American ships, and we know many of their names. According to the explorer Richard Burton, they were known for their integrity, frugality, perseverance, and their international credit and banking networks. Now, they traded in everything, including arms and slaves, but had scruples about dealing in dried fish and bullocks and so on and so forth. Burton ruled wrote that at least 80% of the foreign trade passed through their hands in Zanzibar. Now, these people had long histories in Kutch. In the 16th century, Seth Topan built the port of Montvi in Kutch and laid the foundation for the shipping, shipbuilding uh, industry there. An Ishmali peer came and converted a large number of Hindus, including Seth Topan. Now, much later, uh, three brothers from this family uh, had built a fleet of 30 ships with brass guns. They had come from Lakpat in Kutch. And one of their sons developed such a strong relationship with the Sultans of Oman that management of the customs of Zanzibar was entrusted to him in 1818. And this remained in the family for the most part until the 1880s. During the 1880s, Muscat's customs were handled by the family. We see a picture of a member of this family, Satheria Tuppen, who grew up in poverty in India, became a merchant prince, a pillar of the Ismaili faith, and he was once the uh, honorary prime minister of Zanzibar. He financed all sorts of trade exposition and he had a role in the abolition of the slave trade. Other huge business uh, empires were founded in Africa by people who came from poor Indian families in Kutch. For example, Siwa Haji Peru uh, controlled the uh, 
caravan trade in German East Africa. And Alidina Visram was responsible for much of the migration of poor Kuchi Ismaili peasants to Kenya and Uganda. The cult, the, the port of Mundra was developed by Bhatias, Jains, and Kojas in the mid 17th century. One of the 17th century found, Jain founders asked a peer for his powers to keep a ship from sinking. So we have a Bukharan Sufi saint who is protecting ships, Jain ships from sinking. And he also convinced the Mughal viceroy not to plunder Kutch. So even today, the leading entrepreneur of Zanzibar and other sailors, whether Muslim, Hindu, or Jain, still seek protection from the saint of the sea at his shrine. And today, Mundra is a huge Mecca port in India. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robbins. I think uh, we should, uh, before uh, wasting any more time. I mean, we can always take up the questions and suggestions later. Once I think uh, Professor McLeod uh, finishes his talk, then we can take the questions. So before uh, wasting any time, I would invite uh, Professor John McLeod to please deliver his talk. Thank you very much, Maitri. And uh, good evening to all my friends in India. Good afternoon to people in Europe. Uh, good morning to Ken, Bill, and anyone else in North America. Um, as Ken has mentioned, for 5,000 years, Gujaratis have had an affinity with sea travel. Uh, so as Ken mentioned, the two main ports of the Harappans, uh, Dholavira and Botel, were in Gujarat. For hundreds of years, Gujarati traders sailed the Indian Ocean to the Middle East and East Africa. And of course, Surat was the main port of the Mughal Empire. And all of this makes it no surprise that taxes on seaborne trade were a major source of revenue for many Gujarati rulers. And as the Mughal Empire declined during the 18th century, princes and would-be princes in Gujarat sought to control ports where they could uh, tax trade. And the same opportunity to tax trade attracted the British. As the East India Company established control over India, almost all of the princely territory with a coastline was annexed to the British dominions. Last week, for example, we saw how this happened in the case of Surat. And by the mid 19th century, in all of India, there were only 14 princely states that had seaports. And no fewer than nine of these were in Gujarat. Baroda, Kutch, Junagar, Nawanagar, Bhavnagar, Porbandar, Morvi, Jafrabad, and Cambay. Uh, and Ken has masterfully spoken of the ports of Cambay and Kutch. Now, the ports of these states in Gujarat gave rise to some of the bitterest disputes between the Indian princes and the British. Gujarati princes claimed that as sovereign monarchs, they had the right to administer their own custom services and to retain all of the taxes or duty that they collected on foreign goods that came by ship to their ports. By contrast, the British insisted that their government of India should oversee the ports to prevent smuggling, to supervise the collection of customs to ensure that the taxes were taken at appropriate rates, and to receive the duty on any imports from foreign countries that were unloaded in the states, but subsequently went on to the parts of India that were under direct British rule, known as British India. In other words, the disputes over collection of customs duties at ports illustrates the theme that I discussed last week, the prince's quest for sovereignty and the British quest for control. Now, for most of the 19th century, very few foreign goods entered British India through the Gujarati states. The state ports were unable to receive anything larger than small coastal boats, and there was no rail line linking them to British India. In theory, all goods that crossed the frontier from the princely states into British India were subject to the full British tariff. But in practice, no systematic effort was made to collect duties on what little merchandise did leave the states. But all of this changed in the 1890s when railway construction 
made British India easily accessible from the ports of the Gujarat states. And in order to earn customs revenues, some princes in Gujarat began to encourage merchants to land foreign goods at their ports and then to transport them by train to British India. Uh, and these inducements often included very low duties on imports. Uh, that may not seem to make too much sense, but the philosophy was that collecting low duties on imports that came to state ports was better than collecting none at all, which is what would have happened if the goods had been landed at British Indian ports. And increasingly, merchants who had hitherto used Karachi, Bombay, and other ports in British India began to ship goods through the ports of the maritime states of Gujarat. And the result of this is that an ever-increasing share of the customs revenue that the British government of India had formerly collected now began to flow into state treasuries. And over the next 50 years from the 1890s, the British paramount power and the maritime states of Gujarat engaged in an elaborate dance with each side trying to secure its own interests. The relationship seems to have closely followed British assessments of how secure colonial rule was in India, and consequently how far the British needed to conciliate the princes in order to maintain their support. So for example, in 1905, uh, when despite agitation over the recent partition of Bengal, the British felt themselves to be relatively safe, the government of India asserted its control over the princes by establishing a customs cordon around the maritime states of Kutch, Junagar, Navanagar, Porbandar, Morvi, and Jafrabad. And this customs cordon was called the Viramgam Line, from the name of a town on the frontier. Customs stations were built at every point of entry from these states into British India. And all goods leaving the princely states for British India were required to pay the British Indian import duty when they crossed the frontier. Uh, for a combination of historical and legal reasons, Baroda and Bhavnagar were exempted from the Viramgam Line and goods that landed in those two states continued to enter British India for free. So as of 1905, the British felt that they could essentially heavily tax goods that landed at the princely state ports. But by 1916, it was clear that the Viramgam line was not working. Smugglers were landing foreign goods at ports in the maritime states, and they either paid or simply evaded low state customs duties and then they would smuggle their goods across the Viramgam line. Also, a plausible case could be made that the customs cordon hindered industrial development in the Gujarati princely states. And perhaps more importantly, from the British point of view, the Viramgam line engendered enormous bad feeling on the part of the princes in Gujarat. And this was now an issue as of 1916. In 1916, the First World War is raging. And the British want to ensure that they can maintain as much support in India for their war effort as possible. And as a result of that, in 1916, the British government of India drafts agreements by which the states that had been covered by the Viram Gum Line undertook uh, to levy import tariffs at least as high as those were collected at British Indian ports. And they also undertook to ensure that banned goods did not land at their ports at all. And the rulers of the Gujarati states of Junagar, Nawanagar, Korbandar, Morvi, and Jafrabad duly signed these agreements. Once they had signed these agreements, the Viram Gam line was lifted, and the maritime states of Gujarat, with the exception of Kutch, which was not included, regained free access to British India. So the point here is that at this time, when the British want the support of the princes, they resume allowing goods that had come into the princely states resume allowing those to enter British India free of customs duty. Now, this in turn creates a new situation because so long as the maritime states enjoy free access to British India, their customs revenues were limited only by the volume of trade that entered at their ports. And almost immediately after signing these agreements, uh, the signature actually took place in 1917, Several rulers therefore set about trying to increase the share of British India's imports that came through their territories. And the governments of Baroda, Junagar, and Nawanagar sought to remove the main physical barrier to increase trade, which was the quality of their ports. Because as of 1917, the ports in those states had primitive docking facilities, and none of them had a harbor deep enough to receive large ocean-going steamers. 
So in the early 1920s, three states, Baroda, Junagar, Nawanagar, began pouring huge amounts of money into port development. And other states made plans to follow suit. The first port to be fully modernized was Baby in Nawanagar. It became fully operational in 1926, 1927. And this immediately paid off, uh, just as an illustration of this. In 1917, 1918, when the previous agreements had been signed, uh, the ruler of Nawanagar, Maharaja Jamsam Ranjit Singhji, had received 3.6 lakhs of rupees from the customs duties. By 1925, 1926, this had increased to just under 30 lakhs. And with the completion of Beatty, it mushroomed to an astonishing 78 lakhs the very next year. So uh, Nawanagar's customs duties rise within a period of 10 years from 3.6 lakhs to 78 lakhs. And the result of this is that Nawanagar, which in the big picture was a small state, was on the road to earning 2% of the total British Indian customs revenues. And with other modern ports set to open in Baroda and Junagar, the British government in Delhi was faced with a serious threat to its customs revenues. And the government of India then reconsiders what it had done. There's now a feeling in Delhi that it had been wrong to grant the maritime states free entry in 1917. Now, fortunately, as of 1926, 1927, when Beatty becomes operation, the political situation in India seems to the British to be quiescent, and they don't see any particular need to conciliate the princes. So the government of India comes up with the argument that the development of these ports had been unhealthy, and it immediately reimposes the Viramgam line on Junagar, Nawanagar, Porbandar, Morvi, and Jafrabad. And this was explained on two grounds. First of all, while the low port charges that the states levied did not contravene the letter of the agreements from 1917, they could be interpreted as a violation of the spirit of the agreements. And secondly, a very technical point, the expansion of ports like Beatty had been paid for with customs revenues. And the government of India claimed that this gave them an unfair advantage over British Indian ports. Because by law in British India, ports could only be developed with money that came from incidental port charges, not money that came from customs revenues. Uh, so the British have now reimposed the Durham Gun Line. But that in turn could cause some serious headaches for both travelers and for exporters. Um, from 1905 to 1917, uh, tolls had been collected as goods crossed the Viram Gam line by rail. And that had led to holdups in trains and so on and so forth. So that system is not restored. Rather, the government of India orders the duty on all imports collected by the states will have to be collected at the port of entry. So if, a good, if goods land, for example, in Beatty, the government of Nawanagar will collect the full British Indian duty. And then if those goods are shipped on to British India, they would have to be accompanied by a certificate certifying that the proper duty had been, state, had been paid at Beatty. And then the British Indian Customs Service would take the certificate when the goods crossed the frontier, and they would recover the duty from the Nabonagar authorities. Now, this certificate meant that states could only retain the duty on goods that were actually consumed in Saurashtra, and they would lose everything collected on goods that were re-exported to British India. And not surprisingly, the reimposition of the Viram Gam line in 1927 angered the rulers of all the maritime states in Saurashtra, and no doubt also angered other princes who saw this as a breach of the agreements of 1917. And Ranjit Singhji, Ranjit Singhji the Jamsam, had particular reason to feel betrayed, because on the strength of the assurances that he had received from the government of India in 1917, he had spent huge sums of money to transform Beatty into a major port of entry for goods destined for markets all over northwestern India. He had anticipated that the duties collected at Beatty would assure his state a sizable revenue. But with the reestablishment of the customs cordon, with the reestablishment of the Viram Gum line, his income from duties on imports plunges. 1926-1927, it had stood at 78 lakhs. 1927-1928, it falls from 78 to 14 lakhs. And perhaps even worse, if you accept my argument about the prince's quest for sovereignty, Ranjit Singhji was also losing the monarch's right 
to keep all the duties levied at his state ports, and therefore he was losing an element of his sovereignty. But within a matter of months, the political situation in India was transformed. In November 1927, Indians were outraged by the appointment of the All-British Simon Commission to study constitutional reform for the country. The Indian National Congress revived, Mahatma Gandhi returned to politics, and this is followed by the renewal of anti-British civil disobedience, a demand by the Indian National Congress for the same status within the British Empire that was enjoyed by Canada, Australia, and other self-governing colonies, and eventually the rise of an even more radical faction of the Congress under the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru. And the British perceived their position to be under a greater threat than it had been for years. They were once again in need of Indian allies, and once again they turned to the princes. And probably for this reason, only a few months after reimposing the Biram Gamalai, they sought to conciliate the rulers of the maritime states. Um, in 1928, the British and the princes, other than the Jamsab, agreed that so long as they continued to collect customs duties at the British Indian rate, the princes would be allowed to retain the money that they collected on goods destined for re-export to British India, provided that the total did not exceed two lakhs of rupees. Once that figure had been reached, the states would have to hand over all taxes collected on goods that crossed the Virangam line. But only Namanagar and Baroda had attained that limit. And that meant that the other maritime states, Junagar, Korbunder, Morvi, Jafarabad, regained free entry into British India. Now, that still left the question of Nawanagar, which, remember, had collected huge amounts of taxes. And the Jamsab and the British eventually agreed to take the dispute to arbitration. And in 1934, following this arbitration, the British agree that Nawanagar can keep the first five lakhs of rupees that it collected in duties. This then set the, set the stage for further negotiations with all of the maritime states. And that eventually led to the conclusion of new customs agreement, new customs agreements between the government of India and Junagar, Nawanagar, Korbandar, and Morvi. Uh, these were completed in 1936. And a few years later in 1940, a similar agreement was concluded with Jafrabad. And in these agreements, the states promised that they would maintain British Indian rates of duty. Uh, and they undertook to grant no rebates or subsidies to any incidental charges. So the idea here now is that goods landing at state ports will pay the same amount of tax of all kinds, customs duty and other charges, that is levied at British Indian ports. Uh, and the government of India agreed that the states could retain two lakhs of rupees out of the duties that were collected on merchandise that crossed the Virangam line for each year since 1927 and in the future. And if Delhi was satisfied that the states were upholding their part of the agreement, they could keep five lakhs. Now, the agreements that were made in 1936 governed customs collection at the ports of Saurashtra until after the independence of India. And then, as I mentioned last week, in January 1948, the states of Saurashtra, which included most of the maritime states, were merged into the new United State of Kadiavad. And soon afterwards, the new state and the government of Free India concluded an agreement that transferred control of the customs of the Saurashtra ports to the government of India in return for compensation. But the 50 years of controversy over imports through state ports represents an illustrative, if forgotten, aspect of the economic history of the princely states of Gujarat. And I will stop there for now, but I will be pleased afterwards to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor McLeod. Uh, as I can see, there are a few questions uh, that we have here. So one is uh, asking about the port of Okamandal and why did the British keep the port with themselves? And uh, was it for the purposes of, uh, was it for the revenue or for the other purposes? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, Oka was a uh, port that, from the looks of the map, it should have been in Baroda territory. But from the early 19th century, when the British established the Paramount Sea, uh, they bring it under British control. And I think that it's a com combination of factors. Some of it was definitely for revenue, although at the time that the British take it, it probably didn't have that high revenue. Uh, I do think a problem with pirates was another concern. 
In the 1810s, 1820s, uh, the British claim that there's a very serious problem with pirates um, in the Gulf of Kutch, uh, and they at least claim that they need to have Hoka as a base for that. So I think that it's, it's uh, I would say, both revenue purposes and also uh, alleged concerns over security and over pirates. I think that uh, we had a chapter in the book about Okamondo, and, you know, the whole question was, uh, how do we see the Wagars from this point in time? These were local rulers, and like so many of the other uh, people who were unsuccessful in power struggles, they went on to, uh, you know, make their living by, uh, by plundering. And this was an ongoing problem of uh, the Baroda could not really, from its distance, control these people. And the British were constantly running, running there to, to help uh, restore order. Uh, in addition to which, we you know, have the question of, did Baroda want to develop the port initially because their concern uh, was that the British might take it if they did develop it. Uh, but eventually in the, 19th, in the 20th century, they did develop it. And uh, we you know, try to document how they, uh, how they handled it. I think that uh, Okamondo had a second sort of problem because it was the area where Dwarker was and therefore was extremely prestigious to the various local rulers who made claims like the uh, Jam Sahibs and so on and so forth to uh, have uh, their way in this territory. Okay, so uh, another another thought that really pops in my head is that suppose if if the uh, local uh, rulers, if suppose if they would not really uh, let's say pay attention to the demands made by the colonial power, then were there any replications? Uh, were they fined or uh, were they given any sort of a punishment to put it crudely? Uh, yeah, you mean, for example, if a prince did not collect the taxes that the British demanded at his ports, um, I think that in that case, the British simply would not allow those goods to enter British India at all. Um, so long as the goods were just being consumed within the state, the it probably would not be a large volume of goods. So I think in general, the British would kind of wink at that. Um, they might even take the position that on goods that are just consumed within, let's say, um, poor Bunder, uh, the uh, rulers of poor Bunder could collect whatever duties they wanted, that it becomes a concern to the British when the goods are going on into British India and uh, seen as, as um, uh, sort of interfering with the revenues of British Indian ports. So I think the main there, thing would be, oh, yeah, please, Ken, go ahead. Uh, do you think that, uh, John, there's a difference between the government of Bombay and the government of India in this sort of thing? Um, Yes, to some extent they, there is. Um, government of Bombay does, did not have the power to collect duties, uh, so I don't think that it would really see that as being something under its concern. All of the duties would have gone to the government of India. Um, it, it's sort of a, what is complicated here is that in the middle of all of these disputes, this is when the states in Gujarat are transferred from the control of the government of Bombay to the government of India, which happens in two phases in 1924 and 1933. Um, but I think that the government of Bombay would just see that as being something they could offload to the government of India um, since they would not see themselves as being hurt by whatever happened in state court. So it, it kind of, let's not worry about that. Let's let the people in Calcutta or Delhi worry about what's happening in the state courts. Okay. I think uh, there's another question. Did the Indian rulers ever demand taxes from the British ships or merchants? Was there ever this or the other way around? Uh, yeah, if any, if a British ship or a British merchant landed at a state port, then it would be subject to whatever taxes the local prince wanted to collect. Uh, and the British recognized the princes ha as having that right, that they could administer their own custom services. So uh, yes, that could happen. Um, and in fact, I think one of the reasons that uh, beginning in the 1890s, more and more shipping goes through state ports. A lot of that is probably in Indian ships, but some of it is probably also in British-owned ships. Um, but if the um, princes are charging lower duties than what they would have to pay at Bombay or Karachi, uh, I suspect a lot of British merchants would say, that's great, we will, we will use these ports um, because it's to our benefit. Also, yes, the princes did have the power to collect taxes 
for British ships, British merchants at their ports. And let's not lose sight of the, the thing that we keep on talking about and that I know Maitri is going to be talking about is that economic power did not rest only with the rulers. Economic power rested with indigenous uh, business interests, uh, not only uh, the shippers and so on and so forth, but the bankers who finance governments. And um, so you have to talk about their concerns as well. And if you put this down as just between the British and the, uh, and the Indians, I don't think that that's the whole story. This whole story is that there are um, Indian elites in Bombay and Surat who are also exerting their power over the things and feeling that they, that they want their interest to be preserved rather than those of some Maharaja. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we'll just take one last one. So this is by Chaya Goswami, who's, who happens to be my friend. And she has worked quite a lot on uh, the Gujarati traders and the Indian Ocean. So her question is uh, rather, uh, how do you read or rethink on the port to port transfer theory in case of the ports of Kutch, where interlinking and interlocking ocean and delta hinterland and inland networks develop the idea of complexity? Yeah. yeah, and the, yeah, and Kutch certainly is in a separate category. Um, part of it is, of course, its long maritime history. The fact that for so long, uh, so long, Kutch ports were entrepots for all across northern, northwestern India, for Sindh, for uh, Rajasthan, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think partly connected with that, Kutch was never part of these agreements that the British concluded. I think the British uh, just thought that, uh, that the situation in Kutch is is kind of hopeless. Um, but I think that definitely you've raised a good point there. Um, I'll, I'll maybe turn this to Ken since he did speak on Kutch in his, in his presentation. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there were all sorts of different issues that uh, come up, you know, and the question was, was this a matter of usage where the British could do exactly what they want or was it governed by certain legal questions? Um, for example, was the Port of Bhavnagar treated differently? And the problem that we're talking about here, uh, and that was because uh, of uh, certain treaties and that had been established in the 19th century. But here we have a very different situation because you have a, uh, an international shipping uh, elite that is working with Kutch, that has roots in Kutch and has powers and uh, influence with the British. So I think the situation was different uh, in, in that sense. And I don't think that that's been explored unless Chaya, that should be your next book. So I think uh, what we can uh, actually say this, I think many of the historians have actually put this up in their works, is that the British rule and the British control was by and large supported by these agencies of different kinds which were operating and uh, which were actually upholding the fabric of this colonial control. So it's, it's, it's not the control that was exercised by the uh, East India Company's uh, servants as much as by these merchant groups, these agencies. Because as we can see very clearly that is coming out from today's two lectures that Definitely, there was uh, some, am some amount of control that was exercised by the colonial government, but this control was also in reverse. So there was also a greater amount of control that was exercised by these agencies. So I think uh, Chaya has already done a lot of work and uh, maybe you know one day we can get to talk and maybe once we come up with the revised editions, of our books, then maybe we can, <laughs> that's being too ambitious, but maybe one day. So thank you very much, all of you, for your comments. And thank you, Professor McLeod, once again. Your uh, lecture was uh, absolutely informative. I'm sure everybody here present here has benefited. And Ken, as usual, is uh, absolutely passionate about what he speaks. And uh, therefore, thank you very much, both of you. Now, uh, I think, um, I'll begin with what I want to talk about, 
Ken has already given you all certain amount of background. So, uh, and we'll continue from what we were talking earlier and mostly which is that uh, when we talk about the local, local agencies, then we often talk about the fact that when the princely states were created, princely states were created or Indian states were created uh, after the decline of the Mughal empire, some of them were created, some of them were, uh, as C.A. Bailey calls them as successor states. So this was uh, the, the acts which were not in isolation. There were a um, lot of uh, agencies which had supported. So today the title of my lecture is Women in the Family Firms Financing the State of Baroda. Now historians in general and business historians in specific have failed to note or search for women's participation in financial activities. The interaction of both men and women with business has been carried out for centuries, mostly as producers and consumers, but also as managers and workers. It is believed that women perhaps were the first horticulturalists and agriculturalists, and uh, I would not be surprised to learn that they were the first traders, yet trading and mercantile activities continues to be perceived as a male activity. Business histories of the regional states or princely states, if you may, are far and few. This could be because the thrust of majority of scholarship has remained on British India. Baroda state as the largest princely state or regional state in Gujarat has been the subject of interest of few scholars of business history. However, the attention was more on adaptation of a local economy to Western ideas and then them uh, uh, changing into something akin to a colonial economy. Very little attention has been paid to understand the local urban and rural economy. I can in fact say with great surety that had it not been for the local business communities, financing the state administration, Baroda State would not have survived. The researches carried out in the last few decades have highlighted the importance of financial operations carried within the state from inception of money lending firms to establishment of Bank of Baroda. It is thus not surprising that there is almost no effort to apply the lens of gender to the history of business activity within the state. In any case, the traditional business history has been blind to gender roles. This could be due to paucity of sources and more importantly, lack of inclination to look at the events from gender point of view. During the 18th century, family and inheritance were the base through which women managed the business. Therefore, it will not be out of place to use the term family firm to mean money lending corporations, which had mushroomed in large numbers. And as I had mentioned earlier, which was sponsoring the nascent Baroda state. These family firms continued to control the economy of Baroda state very much up until the second half of the 19th century. While pouring through the letters and chitthis and varats of the family firm of Hari Bhakti, which was the largest family firm in the city of Baroda, an interesting fact came to light. Most of the communication, although was addressed to or by the house of Hari Bhakti, who had long since passed away, letters would end with an unfamiliar C or hand. Curious, I dug deeper and read up on the family genealogy. It became clearer to me that mortality rate amongst men for reasons unknown was high. This meant that men died at a young age, leaving their young wives to adopt sons. Since men of the family firm had died and the successor was an infant, then who was running the show? The logical conclusion was that the Munims or Gumashtas, that is the clerks who were trained for this very purpose, <coughs> excuse me, were conducting business on behalf of the family firms. Digging deeper, 
I came across a number of complaints that were lodged by the firm to the rulers of Baroda and against the firm's clerical and bookkeeping staff. This was mostly regarding the mismanagement of funds. Since the residency was established within the state, I also decided to check various reports written by the residents to the Bombay government. One particular resident, Colonel James Outram, persistently wrote about how women of various family firms had complained to him regarding the mismanagement of funds. In fact, they had given a lot of data. So they had substantiated their accusations with evidences. They had provided data. Now, unfortunately, uh, the conclusions that I derive are circumstantial because there are no direct mention of any women, women actually operating, but they come as close to reality as they can. Even if women were managing the affairs, despite the fact their names do not figure, so we cannot really directly say, but if we eliminate a lot of other factors, then it becomes clear that uh, this, this was a woman who was writing to the resident. This was a woman who was writing to the Maharaja. She was not only writing them, one of them actually goes to Bombay, visits the office, and then delivers a letter written by hand. So she was literate, she could count, and there is no uh, denying the fact that she was the one who was, let's say, a matriarch, as we can will be seeing with examples as well. So it became clear to me that the firms at the time when all of this was going on, they were making profits, which meant that the family firms were sponsoring the state. They were carrying out successful business trans transactions, loaning money to the other agencies, collecting revenues, making religious donations, and so many other uh, business activities they were conducting. So therefore, I can say that this is not a point of conjecture, but conclusion that the women of these family firms were handling the businesses successfully. In fact, they were the women who ruled their shops and at times even fought to protect the right of their sons against the wily uh, Munims or Gumashtas. Uh, Colonel Outram notes of many such cases, but I have picked up only one case study uh, here. The rest of them are discussed in the article in our book. So I have chosen today to discuss the case study of uh, Sahukari Pedi, henceforth family firm of Hari Bhakti. The first woman conducting business that come, came to my notice was Ratanbai. She was the widow of Bhakti of the family firm of Hari Bhakti. So a little bit about Hari Bhakti. Hari and Bhakti were brothers and in the course of 18th century were able to set up branches of the family firm in different parts of Western India. Around late 18th century, they set up their main branch in Varuda that catered to the state's financial requirements. They acquired great power through such dealings. Bhakti died at Baroda in 1794 to 1795 CE, leaving his business to be handled by his widow, Ratanbai, as the couple did not have any children. Hari died at Pune, where he had established his branch the following year. He had married twice, but still did not have a son. After the death of both the brothers, Ratanbai managed both Pune and Baroda operations. Since she was based in Baroda, she had to appoint someone to handle Pune operations on her behalf. She appointed Dullab Das, a distant relative, as her deputy to look after the affairs of Pune. He stayed in this position for three years. However, soon he extended his claim as the successor of Hari at Pune and made an attempt to take over the business. Ratanbai did not take this lying down. She rushed to Pune and reclaimed her property. Despite, and this was the time when women did not have any property rights. Ratanbai wielded enough influence in Peshwa's court to turn the case in her favor. She was able to maintain pressure on Dullab Das by keeping his family in confinement and placing him under house arrest. The matter was taken to the Peshwa's court. The court intervened and sought explanations and as a me measure of settlement, advised her to adopt a boy to counter the claims of Dullab Das. 
So she, on 5th of December, 1803, she, uh, with the sanction of Pune Darbar, adopted Shamar or Samal, as, who was her nephew. And she appointed him as the sole uh, inheritor of the property of Hari and Bhakti. At the time of adoption of Shamar, she paid 10 lakhs of rupees as Nazar to the Gaikwad for the recognition of his claim. So this rupees that I'm saying, I'm talking about, this is Baba Shahi currency that was used. Ratan Bai, as the head of the family firm, successfully negotiated business, both with the Gaikwad Sarkar and the Peshwa, and later on with the British government. Her assumption of power was met with mute resentment by the local parties, especially the Sahukari community. But since the firm wielded enough financial and political influence, no open remonstrance was made against her. She participated in the local politics and ensured that every transaction proved profitable for the family firm. This of course meant loss of power for the others. So uh, therefore, obviously there was going to be some kind of a uh, problem that would surface. So as we can see from this example, that in 1802, at the time of Kadi war, this was a war fought between, uh, this was a war of succession fought between Anand Rao and Kanhoji Rao, Gaikwad and Malar Rao of Kadi. And uh, Kanhoji had the support of Ratan Bai. Now, uh, Divan Raoji Apaji had sought the help of English East India Company. And uh, the company was waiting for such an opportunity to get inroads, political inroads into Gujarat. And uh, through this, they first of all uh, uh, gauged the situation, assessed it, and then came to a conclusion that uh, via Gaikwad, they would have a better advantage in Gujarat. So therefore, uh, they supported the cause of Anand Rao. But here they faced a formidable enemy or let's say uh, an opponent in form of uh, Ratan Bai. So the British joint forces of Baroda and the British were unable to capture Kanhoji. So they admit that since the widow favored Kanhoji, it was going to be difficult. So I'll just quote what they say, quote, the unbounded credit he's understood to possess with the widow and inherited of Hari Bhakti a very rich banker at Baroda, which lady is believed to sacrifice any sum of money for the release of favorite Kanoji, unquote. So this is a letter which the um, resident is writing to the Bombay uh, governor. And um, it's very clear that they, quite, they were quite afraid that if the lady continues to support Kanoji, they would not be able to have their way. So she was, of course, a strong-willed woman. And more than that, she was quite shrewd. And uh, she, uh, when she saw that the British were here to stay, she immediately switched sides and uh, moved towards the side of Anandrao Gaikwad. So, so we can clearly see that uh, she was able to change the trajectories of uh, the way history was shaping up, history of Baroda was shaping up. Now, in spite of, she was, she was quite uh, uh, in, on one, in one or two accounts, which, is, uh, which I have noted in the uh, historical selections of Baroda state records, which are in Marathi. It is clearly mentioned as uh, she being a quite strong-willed and a determined woman, and uh, therefore uh, to gain her favor was something that everybody was hoping for. So she, despite the seclusion, she traveled extensively between uh, different uh, dukans of hers. And that is from Pune, she would travel to Pune, to Haridwar, to Bombay, to Baroda. And her involvement in the political affairs of the state shows her acumen for business and for power. She was very conscious of the political and economic status and kept herself constantly informed regarding these matters. She also uh, was quite conscious of preparing the next in line. So she trained uh, her uh, son, Shamar, uh, the tricks of the business. And uh, despite uh, his presence, continues to take key decisions. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, Shamar, uh, the men of these Sahukari Pedis, uh, some, somehow the other way, 
could not really survive. So Shamar also could not live for a long time. And he died, leaving the business in the hands of his wife, uh, Uchrad Bai. So what they would do is as soon as uh, they would adopt a male child or a male child would be born to them, they would immediately fix up a wedding with an infant girl. So even if the child would die, the girl, when she would come of an age, she would be brought to her in-law's home so that she could adopt a boy. So this way, uh, women uh, directly or indirectly played a very important role. Now, when we talk about Uchrad Bai, <coughs> she becomes another, uh, uh, another formidable uh, personality uh, because of uh, whom the PD continues. So Shamar Bhakti uh, died uh, in 1807. And of course, he did not have a, um, any male issue. So his wife, uh, Uchrad Bai, appears to be the one who was running the show. So the first thing that was that she does is that she made a representation to the Gaikwad government to adopt a male child. Now, in the meanwhile, the British government under uh, uh, Major Walker, they had uh, been able to uh, acquire greater control than the Divan, greater control than the Maharaja. So the, what they were asking of these financing agencies or sahukari pedis or family firms was that these family firms were to finance day-to-day -day administration. So since the uh, Gaikwad state was uh, really just, the, it, it was in a nascent state, so they were, they did not have a treasury of their own. So for every, uh, every uh, expense that they would make, they would, uh, they were sponsored, they were financed by these fairies. So therefore, um, they were, they were quite um, clear that the British were clear that if they wanted to have better say in the administration, it's better that they uh, collude with these Sahukari pedis. So uh, when Uchrad Bai approached the Gayakwadi government to uh, give her the permission to adopt a son, uh, of course, Anandrao Gayakwad was a weak ruler, so he turned towards the resident who uh, knew the tradition of Nazrana. So he uh, asked her to pay 10 lakh of rupees as a Nazrana. And without batting an eyelid, apparently, she paid the sum. Now, at the time, the Hari Bhaktis, the firm of Hari Bhaktis, were the potedar of the state. <coughs> so, potedars were the uh, central treasurers. And uh, they were the ones who were financing uh, entire administration. So, I have uh, written another paper, uh, another article, which is there in the book. So, if anybody wants to... Uh, understand the term better, they can read that. So uh, now, since the firm was acting as the potedar, potedar of the state, it had the government's complete support. They recognized and accepted all suggestions coming from the Pedi, which is Uchrad Bai. And uh, ultimately, at many occasions, in many communications, I have noticed that the when the resident is talking about Hari Bhaktis, there's often the term herds. H E R is the uh, uh, pronoun her is used. So it is very clear that they are not talking about uh, the, her name is not mentioned, but uh, we can clearly see that they were not talking about firm, but they were talking about Uchrad Bai. So, um, as I can read out from the one of the observations made by the resident, I'll quote Some of her houses are situated in the territories of this government and other out of its jurisdiction, and therefore regulated that a letter may be given to her granting her permission to transact business in the same manner formally upon the necessary authorities. To this, the government replied that every transaction of her house must be carried on in a fair and honest way, and whatever letters may be required, they shall be granted to her." Unquote. So um, it is clear that there was a greater acceptance of her presence. Now, Uchrad Bai uh, finally adopts a boy and uh, he, he's named as Becher. So therefore you have another uh, family firm, Shamar Becher. And uh, since Becher was minor, she continues to operate 
the uh, business. And um, here, uh, once again, I'll quote, the adopted son, Bejar Shamar, is to transact business in consonance with the wishes of his mother, Uchirad Bai, and as long as she lives, he is to acquaint her with everything that is done, unquote. She bargains with the Gaikwadi Darbar as her family firm had the Potedari rights. And uh, therefore, uh, it is very clear that she had, a, she had an upper hand for a very long time. Now, um, in, in a certain sense, we can conclude that she successfully forced the government to accept her as the head of the family firm. She ensured that the powers would be retained in her hands till she lived. She was able to extract the guarantee of the company to all these terms. So company was giving guarantee or bahidari as it was called. And um, she secured the rights of her family for her coming generations. So um, Shamar Becher or Becher Shamar as he's known in some records, he was uh, the next in line. So when he grew to be an adult and he went underwent all the processes of training, uh, he was healthy enough to grow to be at least 40 years old. He got married twice and handled the matters of business. A son was born to Shamar Becher and his first wife, who later on inherited the business, Mahalakshmi Bai, uh, was the one who uh, I have noticed in the letters, because we in, in our department, the Haribhakti family has donated a lot of their uh, documents. Uh, their business, these are the ledgers. And uh, I had uh, a chance to look at some of the letters. And uh, many, uh, some of the letters that I had looked at uh, were signed by Mahalakshmi Bai. So uh, Mahalakshmi Bai was not uh, really well versed in the uh, business dealings, but she was definitely handling the religious matters. So uh, his uh, Shamar Bechers or Bechar Shamar's second wife, she uh, is, uh, she appears to be more ambitious and uh, uh, her case becomes uh, fairly big, uh, especially, uh, I think uh, there is this, I, those of you who know of Baroda State, they would know of Khatpat report, which uh, Colonel Outram had written, which talked about how the, uh, the Gumashtas and the Munims were troubling the women of Sahukari, Pedis or family firms. So uh, uh, when Shamar Becher died in 1845, uh, Joyti Bai, the second wife, uh, the smarter one, she was at the time pregnant and a posthumous son was born to her. Before she could pitch a battle for the rights of her infant son, she had to fight to keep the rights of her family over the firm. So the name of the Gumashta or the clerk was Baba Nafda. I'm sorry, I'm throwing a lot of names at you here, but uh, in order to get a bigger picture, little names are required. So the Gumashta or the clerk was interested with the management of the affairs of the house by Shamar Becher. Now, Baba Nafda took advantage of the illness and eventual death of Shamar Becher and embezzled funds for four years. Joyti Bai, who was well versed with the business of the firm, began to make inquiries. She was already aware of it uh, prior to the death of uh, Shamar Becher, but uh, because Shamar Becher was handling the affairs, so she kept it to herself. But later on, when she's making a complaint to the resident, there she uh, talks about the kind of uh, funds that were embezzled by Baba Nafta or the clerk. So uh, once she uh, creates this, prepares a case against him, so uh, little naive, she goes to the guy at Wadi Darbar and uh, makes appeals to the Maharaja for reparations. Now, uh, we don't have any account from coming from the court, but we do have uh, the resident continuously writing to the Bombay government. So we don't have a complete picture. And we have one side of the story the story given by the president. So in the story, of course, the Darbar is corrupt and the Maharaja is corrupt and he's, uh, he doesn't care, he's lazy, etc. All these adjectives are used. But we, if we just, uh, just push all that aside, 
then the case becomes quite clear that uh, Baba Nafda had friends in the Darbar and the matters never reached Sayajira II and later on Ganpatra Gayakwad. So the resident uh, was the one who was handling these. And uh, uh, now when she approaches the Darbar, she's uh, thrown out of the Darbar and ridiculed. Uh, ultimately, it is uh, uh, not she who actually approaches the Bombay government. It is her mother, Lal Bai, who, uh, in order to protect the rights of her daughter, who approaches the Bombay government, writes to them, and uh, tells them that this is how my daughter is being treated. She is under the Bahedari or the guarantee of the British government. So it is up to them to protect her. So uh, on the other hand, Baba Nafda has had moved fast and he uh, accused uh, jo Joiti Bai of putting forward the claims of her child to usurp power. So, a claim that he really could never prove. Now he resorts to devious means and even house arrested Joyti Bai along with their infant, along with her infant son. So the child unfortunately died in confinement. And according to residents' accounts, despite her repeated appeals, no help came from the Darbar. <clears throat> the case was tried in the Panchayat which gave the decision in favor of Baba Nafada. So the Gayakwad Dalbar did not show much interest in the matter. Uh, there were multiple reasons for it, but uh, uh, maybe the fact was that uh, uh, the matter really did not reach the Gayakwad, or maybe the fact that it was Baba Nafada who had control over the funds of the firm. And uh, if any monetary favors were to be obtained, it could be obtained through him. The second reason could be that Sayajirao II was succeeded by his son, Ganpatra Gayakwad, who did not have ample time to be acquainted with the detailed nuances of the case. Nonetheless, <clears throat> Jyoti Bai was not the one to accept defeat. She appealed, kept on appealing to different parties. And uh, ultimately, she found hearing and uh, she was able to uh, because she had already prepared her papers well, so she uh, supported uh, uh, the inquiry made by <clears throat> the resident and uh, ultimately uh, a, a commission was set up which investigated and uh, it was found out that uh, the that Baba Nafda was guilty and uh, Joyti Bai uh, was <clears throat> given uh, was given the uh, correct decision some kind of justice and uh, we can say that she was given the charge of the firm and although she could not survive for a longer period of time she could survive only for three to four years so in the meanwhile of course her child had died in the confinement so she then moves the papers to adopt another uh, son the uh, demand was denied by the Gayakwad. So there is no explanation given anywhere as to why uh, a woman of such an influence actually faces such a fate. But the fact of the matter is that uh, because of the presence of these women, uh, the Haribhakti Peri continued to survive for a very long period of time. In fact, uh, they go on to uh, they are still uh, quite, uh, uh, let's say, successful. They are still quite rich. Uh, they are still eating on the uh, on the income generated by their forefathers in the 18th and the 19th centuries. So, <clears throat> besides the family firm of Hari Bhakti, women belonging to other Savukari pedis, such as that of Ratanji Kandas, Mairal Narayan, Kushal Chandambaydas. Uh, and many others, uh, they successfully ran business operations in Baroda state. So to conclude, I can <clears throat> say that uh, this is one area that we have, nobody has ventured into. Uh, people are beginning to uh, talk about it. People are beginning to uh, at least read them be between the lines, but a whole lot of work still needs to be done. So uh, thank you very much, all of you, for your patient uh, hearing. 
Now, if there are any questions, then I can take them. Okay, I don't see any questions. Okay, there's one. How was the interrelationship of those bankers during that time? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, when we talk about the interrelationship, so it was uh, they were business communities. <clears throat> they were definitely in competition with one another, but uh, they were also uh, helping one another. So uh, there was a place for everyone in the administration. So I've written about the kind of relationships that the bank, that the Saukari Pedis had with each other. You can read, if you will have to buy the book and read about it. Uh, yes, I think that would be great. And uh, uh, Gita, uh, Gita, Gita uh, Rathor is asking more about the piracy. And we've talked a little about it in the past. And there isn't time to go over it. Uh, but I hope that we can speak more about it uh, before the end of the thing. I think she's right. Uh, we are actually ending now. Good. Thank you, John. Thank you, Maitri. Thank you very much, all of you, for your time. And uh, good night to those in India. And uh, have a nice day to those in the UK and the US. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining. And we will see you tomorrow at the same time. The link for tomorrow's uh, lecture will be uh, the link that you had used uh, yesterday and uh, in the previous days. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Right.